It's January 31st, 2012, and this is the conclusion of the 9-3 lecture. Uh, we had left off at this point where we were given a bunch of data and were asked to say, uh, does this data give us conclusive evidence that the dissolved oxygen level in the stream uh, uh, is below uh, 5 milligrams per liter? Um, let's uh, attack this with the four-step process. And this is going to be, because we've already done the problem of this type, this is going to be a pretty abbreviated uh, uh, example. Um, population, water samples. I'm sorry, water from a stream. Uh, what's our parameter that we're interested in? Let's go parameter right. And again, parameters are in, in this chapter are going to be followed by the word either proportion or mean. In this case, it's going to be mean dissolved oxygen level. What is our H naught claim? If we're trying to find out whether this ev this sample is ev or these samples are evidence of a oxygen level below five, we're going to assume an oxygen level of five, and then we're going to follow that out with an HA claim that we're going to see if the, the evidence suggests that it's actually below five, and then what's our alpha level? Point Not given, so we we'll assume 0.05. All right. Any questions so far? No. Okay. Uh, the name of this test is called the the T test. Wait for this little sign to go away. There we go. It's called the T test. The Conditions are, first of all, our sample should be unbiased. Is the sample unbiased? Does it, say, does, it say that the, does it say that the samples are random? If it's random, we're going to give a check mark. Okay. Um, is the sampling independent? Well, normally to test the independence claim, we say, is there... Is there, uh, is it reasonable to think that the population of the samples is 10 times as many samples that we took? So there's 15 samples. Do we think there's the possibility of 150 samples? Actually, from Swimmer River, you can imagine an infinite number of samples. I think it's really reasonable to think that the population is greater than 10 times the sample. Okay, and then lastly, do we have normality? Or is it, do we, have, do we have evidence that the distribution that we're going to compare it to is going to be a normal distribution? And this is where, of course, it gets a little bit, a, a little bit hairy. And the fact is, the sample size is 15. 15 is one of those danger areas, isn't there? 15, we need to have at least no outliers and no strong skewness. How do we check that? Well, we've already got the um, data in the calculator, at least I have the data in the calculator. I could check for outliers by using a box plot. So let me do that really quickly. Uh, let's turn plot one on. Let's make it be a modified box plot. So if there's any outliers, they'll show up as separate dots. The data is NL1. Everything's looking good. I'm going to go do a zoom nine. And there's our box plot. Conclusion, no outliers. Skewness, no. The two whiskers look about the same length. The, the insides of the box looks evenly separated. Looks like a symmetric with no outliers. It looks like we've got a good sample here. Okay, so normality. Sample shows 
no outliers or skewness. So we are good there. Now what? On the step three, the calculation phase. Well, this time we have the data in our calculator. Let's go ahead and do the, the t-test with that data. So we'll choose t-test. And in this particular option, we're going to say data. We are going to say what is our mu naught, or what is the mu associated with the null hypothesis. I believe it was 5. Our data is in list 1. And because it's in list 1, it's going to be able to process that list, come up with a sample mean. It's going to be able to process that list, come up with a sample standard deviation. We don't have to hand enter it. It can calculate, <coughs> calculate it for us. And then lastly, we need to set our alternate hypothesis. Less than? Mu is less than 5. That looks good. Let's go ahead and calculate it. And there's the information that we have to now transcribe into our step three. What's the minimum you need to write down? You need to write down the test, test statistic. You need to tell me how that test statistic converts into a p-value. Probability that p is, and then we steal the inequality sign from the H8 claim. We steal this number and put it in here. And there's one more thing that I need to do. And because there's not just one t distribution, there's many t distributions, I need to say which t distribution I'm working with. If the sample size is 15, the t distribution I'm working on is the one with 14 degrees of freedom. So we use T sub 14 to say which particular T distribution I'm working on. And then we follow that up with what is the probability of that particular outcome? Answer, we look to our screen. P is equal to about 1 point, or 0.18. And now we're ready to finish this up. Because the p-value of 0.18 is greater than the alpha value of 0.05, we fail to reject H0. There is, sorry, that's not how we start that. That's the other one. Um, we <coughs> believe What do we believe? Oh, I'm sorry. I did. Yeah. I, I did have it right the first time. Let's try that again. There is insufficient evidence to suggest. there, that the mean river 
dissolved oxygen levels are below 5. Thank you. All right. And so there's your sort of a version of this using the calculator more, having the calculator do a lot of the work. You see all the same elements, though. All right. Now, um, I'm going to skip some slides here. Um, Oh, uh, that one's still at that example. Um, I want to take a quick look at two -sided, a two-sided version of the same test. Uh, so the Hawaii Pineapple Company, they started doing this new ir irrigation thing, and they want to know whether the irrigation thing has had an effect on the size of their pineapples. They don't know whether because the, the pineapples get more water, they get bigger. They don't know because maybe they're being overwatered, they're getting they're smaller. They just want to know, are there different? Is there a difference? So this will be suggested to be a two-sided test. Now, I'm not going to go through every part of the four-step process for this one. I just want to hit the parts. OK. It was going to happen, but it didn't. All right. The parts that are different for this particular problem. If it's a two-sided test, how does it, how's that show up? in step number one of our four-step process. The alternate hypothesis has a not equal to sign. OK. Oh, la, 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 la. OK, how do we know that? <clears throat> in the previous example with the river stream and the dissolved oxygen, it says, is there conclusive proof that the dissolved oxygen level is less than five Bromer humps? Right? The word less than informed our decision about the, the inequality arrow in the alternate hypothesis. Okay? In this case, let me circle the area the manager wonders if this change will affect the mean weight. Now, in the word effect, we don't know whether that means to get bigger or to get smaller. There's no bias towards a particular direction. Is that okay? Does that, so the words in the problem lead you to, the, to, to that choice. Now, does the fact that it's a two-sided test have any effect in step three? No. None whatsoever. We still need normality. We still need unbias. We still need independence. Does the choice of it being two-tailed have an effect in step three? And the answer is yes, it does. Um, with this mini-tab output, we have enough information to calculate our t-value. <clears throat> our t-value, let's see, where's the mean that they got? There it is. The sample mean was 31.935. Minus our I guess the, the book calls it the mu naught of 31. And then we're going to divide that by the standard deviation of the sample, which is right there, divided by the square root of the sample size, which is 50. All right? And if we throw that in the calculator, hopefully we get. Um, Something that's uh, easy to calculate here. Let's see. I'll clear that old stuff off. Parentheses 319.935 minus 31 divided by parentheses 23, 2.394. And then that is going to get divided by the square root of 50. Get out of the square root and close that parentheses, and we get. 2.76.762, I guess, is our t value. Now that step along isn't isn't different, is it? What's going to be different is when I write my probability statement, because it's not equal to, it is now written with absolute value signs. 
because it's going to be, not only is it going to be, it has to be bigger than 2.76, so that one tail, it has to, considering all the area under the distribution that's less than negative 2.76 on the other side. We summarize that by doing the uh, absolute value sign. And it's got to be greater than the absolute value of that T expression, which is already positive for us. All right? So it's always going to be greater than, because the absolute value is always going to be positive. The absolute value of t is always positive, so it's always a greater than. And now we have to find out what's the p-value associated with that statement. Let's go to our t-table. I had a sample size of 50, so I have 49 degrees of freedom, so I'm going to have to use 40 or 50 for our, my degrees of freedom. Which one? 40. It's the more conservative choice. And now when I look in that, I see that the value that I came up with, which was what? 27? 276 would fall between these two values. And now I go upward to the top of those columns, and there's the p-values that, that, that where I would fall. Okay, one more time. Because my t-value falls in this range, I then go up to the p-values at the top of the column. Now, those are one-sided p-values. But we have a two-sided test, so what we're going to do is double both of those numbers to take into account the two areas that are either side of that, of that uh, distribution. So I'm going to take 0 .005 and 0 .0025 and double it. So if I double 0 .0025, if I double that, I get 0 .005. And if I double 0 0.005, I get 0 0.01. Now, I don't, I don't have an exact p-value, but I have enough to say what? It's less than 0 0.05. They never gave us an alpha value, did they? No. Okay. So... So this is the less than alpha, which leads to reject H naught, which means, in the context of this problem, it means these pineapples are a different size. They used to be 31 ounces, and now it looks like they are different. It looks like they're a little bit bigger. Bigger pineapples are better? Sure. Now, I want to do this problem one more time, but yes? Can you just double that number? Okay. The idea is not that I, I, it's not that I just doubled it. My HA claim, uh, colon there, mu is not equal to 31. When I have a, the distribution of X bars that come from many, many samples of size 50, to be different than 31 means I could be different up here, or I could be different down here. Okay? The table will only tell us that the area that's up there is between 0025 and 005. But I know that there's the exact same area on the other end, and so I can double both of those numbers and get the sum, get a range of values that the sum of those two areas would be. So it starts with the it starts with the HA claim. It leads us to this double tailed or two sided uh, diagram, which leads us to double them. In general, when you're two sided, you, du you double the probability.
the calculator will do it automatically for you, though. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you had done all that calculation work on the calculator alone, tests, key tests from data, uh, what, 31? 31 point, was it nine something? 934. 934, uh, standard deviation of, can't remember. Two point three nine four. Yep, you're right. Two point three nine four. <coughs> sample size of fifty. And if we choose our H not claim, sorry, H A claim to be not equal to, you're going to see that when they calculate it, they get a value that is indeed between point oh oh five and point one. They double that p value for you, so you don't have to remember to do it. Only when we're working with the table do you say, oh yeah, the table only reads one way, so we gotta make we gotta make our adjustments. Is that okay? We're good there? Okay, I'm gonna do the problem one more time. Same problem one more time. And this time I'm not doing a T test. I'm gonna do a T interval, right? And it remembered all the data that I put in earlier. And let's say that we're going to do this at the 95% confidence level. And I get an interval. And if I were to do a four-step process on that, that last step would sound something like, with 95% confidence, we believe that the true mean weight of the pineapples is between 31.254 and 32.614. I believe that if I measured all the pineapples, that their mean weight would fall in that range. What does this mean to us? It means that I don't, I don't believe that the mean weight is 31, do I? This confidence interval gives us similar information than the t-test. I, in fact, it gives us more information. Not only, does I, do, not only do I have the idea that 31 isn't a possible population mean, <coughs> but it also gives me a great idea of where I think the population, pop, population mean actually is. I don't think it's 31. I'm 95% confident, confident, in fact, that it's not 31. And lastly, if it's not in the third, if it's not in the 95% confidence interval, I believe this is also. It's valid to say that I would reject at the 0.05 level. One more time, if I were, if my confidence interval, 95% confidence interval doesn't include the mu naught, I have enough evidence to reject at the 0.05 level. That 95 plus 5 to equal the 100. That's the, the, the calculation that goes on in my head. All right. So there's, again, the relationship confidence interval to, uh, to uh, stati uh, statistical significance testing. All right. Uh, let's go to 15. No, let's go to 16. So in summary, with the two-sided tests, you get a double you got to double the probability for using the table. Um, and again, there's this relationship with the confidence interval. I don't think there's anything more on this slide that we need to talk about. This is them just doing the same problem. This is Minitab doing the same problem that we did on the calculator with their confidence interval. And again, there's that relationship between the, the significance test and the uh, confidence interval. Okay, on to something new, which is on slide eight, 19.
Nope, by 20. There we go, paired data. Okay, let me talk about paired data for just a second. We know from chapter, I want to say four, when we talked about experimental design, we talked about a particular kind of experimental design called the match pair. Okay, most often used when there's something that we can't control for that we think is going to have an effect on our outcomes. Match pair often shows up in what's referred to as a pretest, post test scenario. I want to see how well you learn Spanish over the course of the year. So at the beginning of the year, I give you a Spanish vocabulary test. At the end of the year, I give you another Spanish vocabulary test. And I measure each individual by how much their test score went up because of that Spanish instruction. Each person in that case is paired with themselves. They're nearly identical, so that person is nearly identical except for the fact that they went through the Spanish language training. Pre-test, post-test. Now when we get pre-test and post-test scores, <clears throat> it looks like we have two samples. But we don't. What we say is we have a single sample and that sample is made up of the difference between the scores. So, when we have paired data, how do we attack it? Well, when we have paired data, what we'll do is take every pair, the one that belongs to the single same subject or the same school or the same, <clears throat> the same plot of land if we're doing agricultural. But regardless, we have two numbers for each subject or each thing, and then we're going to look at the differences between those data. And now the inference is what we're going to make about, the inference we're going to make is about mu sub d. The average of the differences. Now, besides the fact that we take two lists of data and we collapse it and make one list of data out of it, everything else pretty much is the same. Okay, for example, here's, a, here's a, an experiment. I'm sorry, did I, that's okay, I can go back. I want to make sure that you get, your, get the chance to get the information. <clears throat> okay. When we get this set of data, the list of all the differences, all those differences now have to <clears throat> conform to all the conditions that we have about T procedures. The people still had to be chosen randomly. They still have to be less than 10% of the population that we're, in study, we're studying. And the differences that list of numbers that represent the one minus the other, it has to be conformed to the normality rules. So here is a study that they, that they give as an example. So you have a bunch of people who, um, well, they're trying to study the, 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 the relationship of caffeine withdrawal with depression. So what do they do? They measure their depression levels before they go off caffeine. And then after they've been without caffeine for a while, they measure their depression levels again. How do they do that? I don't know. They have some test that they, that they say conforms to the ideas of depression. And when they're done, subject one went from a depression level of five to a depression level of 16. Subject number two went from five to 23. Subject four went from four to five. So it looks like I have two data sets here, but all I'm gonna say is, I'm just interested in how much of a change was made. Oh, this person's depression level went up by 11. Second person's depression level went up by 23. 
One person's depression level went down by one. But there's my data. What do I have to do with that data? Well, is it a large enough data set that I think the data set is normal? Sorry, that the, sorry, that the sampling distribution would be normal. No, it's not big enough. How many people were in the study? 11. So I'm in the really... really uh, critical area where it's like, I can't have any outliers, I can't have any skewness, I have to, this sample's got to look normal for me to be able to use T procedures. In this particular study, if caffeine made no difference, then the average difference would be zero. Our h dot claim would be mu of the average difference would be zero, but these particular investigators believe caffeine does make a difference in terms of depression. Or caffeine withdrawal has an effect on depression. So their HA claim is, oh, we think the average difference is actually bigger than one. Okay. Test for conditions. Whoa, that's not what I expected. Overshot it. Where was I? 25? Nope. 23? 22. There we go. So conditions random, conditions normal. Since n is 11, we need to see whether the data, the data, the sample actually looks normal. So you could do a histogram, you could do a box plot, you can use a normal probability plot. There are no outliers, but I'm really concerned about how much different those whiskers look. It sure looks like to me like this is probably a skewed to the uh, skewed to the right. Now, does that mean I stop my work and say I can't do T procedures? PWC. We're going to say proceed with caution. We're going to continue doing the calculation, but we just know that this is a problem, isn't it? All right. So I did see some skewness. I'm going to flag that, and I'm going to continue on. All right, um, they go on to here to uh, calculate the test statistic. I just wanted you to see if you get a, an idea. Looking just at the T value, what do you think? T value of 3.5? Is your intuition starting to say, you know, when I get T values that are bigger than 3, I tend to have significant results? Okay. Well, in this case, uh, the p-value ends up being 0 0.0027. What's your gut reaction to that? What is that? Three times in a three times in a thousand? That probability is pretty low. I think something's going on with caffeine and depression. And if anyone's ever, is there anyone here who's addicted to caffeine? Is there anyone in here who's when they unfortunately like forgot to have their caffeine that day, end up just getting a ripping headache. Actually, that was me, yes, I told that story. I'm caffeine free or down. Since the beginning of the year, I'm caffeine free. If you notice that you're getting your test back in time, I actually feel really, I think I've got better focus now than I have in a long, long time. Yeah. That intervention <laughs> The intervention. Is that the one that happened at the Starbucks? Yeah, okay. All right, so there's pair T test. Um, we conclude that indeed we reject the null hypothesis that we have, uh, we believe we have evidence that depriving caffeine dependent subjects causes increased depression. For me, it, ca it certainly caused in increased nausea. Although I did, I did a great job of weaning myself off of caffeine very, very slowly. And, uh, I didn't, I didn't have any headaches, I didn't have any nausea, it was great. All right, let's talk about using tests wisely. This is the last part, and this is the part that sort of when I hit your quiz, I'm like, oh my gosh, we didn't talk about any of these ideas. So I want to let you know again one more time, the calculator and mini tab and these things that we use to calculate the test statistics T and the P-value, they're all great tools. 
and it makes our job a lot easier to get to the numbers part. But there's still a problem in that we cannot just be calculator robots who take this number and I write this down and that's all there is to thinking about these problems. Okay. So let's talk about some things that you need to keep in mind about this. I'm going to lay out a couple scenarios. All right. Um, let's talk about um, okay, something personal for me. Um, I got a, uh, I had a doctor's appointment over the, the Christmas break, and um, uh, I've got high cholesterol. My cholesterol numbers came in like 215, 220, something like that. Now, why is that? A, why is that an issue? Uh, my bad cholesterol was way up there. But it was also right after the holidays. I went to my sister's house, I went to my other sister's house, I ate <coughs> junk, I ate really greasy hors d'oeuvres. I, I ate everything that makes, for my family, what makes Christmas special. Can I get a second opinion? Can I get a second opinion? Danny, you have learned from a previous lesson. Now, because, no, no, because we did a thing where it's like, if you test people randomly for, let's say, AIDS, probability that you have the virus given that you tested positively without being asymptomatic, that probability is actually pretty small, at least like two-thirds, one-third. No, I didn't get a second opinion because for me, cholesterol, having high cholesterol didn't mean a drastic change in lifestyle. My doctor said I need to exercise more and I need, I need to eat a uh, uh, lower, fat, lower fat diet. <coughs> Not a big deal for me. Okay. So, now that I did go for a second opinion, but here's the point that I want to raise. What if my cholesterol, instead of coming in at 215 or 220, and by the way, the line that they start advising people about cholesterol is 200. What if my cholesterol would have come in at 199? Do I say then, oh, shoot, I'm fine, at 199? Yeah. yeah? <laughs> Load up the eggs, bring on the cheese. <laughs> no, does anyone see a problem with that? Saying 199. Is 199 really substantially different than 201? If my bad cholesterol is really high, yeah. So it's a problem, even though I'm below the line that they put down as a demarcation line. I want you to think about the same thing. What if we did a t-test and the p-value comes in at 0.049. The probability that t is greater than some value comes in at 0.049. What's your reaction to that? Typically our reaction is we're just in a hypothesis. There's a real difference there. It's significant. That water is bad. There's those Loaves of bread are too heavy. All sorts of, we have all these reactions to this p-value being 0.049. What if I did it? What if I came in and the t being greater than some value ends up being 0.051? Failed to reject. We failed to reject the null hypothesis. We failed to reject the null hypothesis. But does that mean there's really, really big change. So when we get around this, these alpha values, when we're right around the alpha values, it's not so cut and dry. The alpha values are, in, in a very real sense, are arbitrary. They're lines in the sand that we've drawn. We said, this is about as much risk of being wrong that I can tolerate. And when, I, when we get p-values that are really, really close to, the va to those values, it really shouldn't be such a cut and dry, we fail to reject or reject, and that's just how it is. Our reaction to these numbers that are really close to our alpha values could very well be, you know what? This one with the p-value of 0.01 or 0.051 is probably worthy of an additional investigation. You know, if we did one more sample, second opinion, 
if we did some more sampling, we may be able to get more insight about how, how different these are. So watch out for strict dogmatic adherence to the, uh, to the alpha value rule, OK? When you're around the alpha value, it should still raise an eyebrow. Just like a cholesterol level of 199 should raise, your al raise an eyebrow for me, I'm not out of the woods. But I am eating a lot more Cheerios. Because they're made of oats, and oats are supposed to be good for lowering cholesterol. OK, another scenario. Are you ready? Another scenario. This time I'm going to use a calculator. OK. Hey, have you heard about that new ACT prep course? No. Yeah. Let me tell you about it. It's 40 hours long. And they have significant, they have evidence that there's a significant increase in ACT scores when they did, uh, when they did a survey, a, uh, a test of it. Isn't that great? Everyone want to sign up for the ACT scores or the ACT prep score? Yeah. Let me tell you about the, the, the results. Are you ready? And I'm going to tell you right now, these results are significant. It used to be that the average ACT score was 23. So there's our H dot claim. But they were able to show proof that their scores are now higher than 23. Hey, you want to see the numbers for that? Too bad, you're going to see them anyway. OK, uh, stats, uh, the old average was 23. Hey, you know what? After they spent 40 hours in this prep course, and they did a sample of those people who went through that prep course, their new average is 23.1, with a standard deviation of 3. And the sample size was 5,000. And they had clear and convincing evidence of significant results. Everyone want to sign up for that, that test prep course now? Of course not. You're seniors. You don't care about the ACT anymore. So the average used to be 23. And after 40 hours of hard study, they got a new average of 23.1. But the results are significant. Look at the p-value. OK, what's the takeaway for this scenario? Not every significant difference is meaningful. Not every significant difference means that we should change our ways. No one would probably be willing to spend 40 hours to, on average, increase their ACT score by one-tenth of, of a point. Would you agree? So even though the results are significant, why did they end up being so significant, even though the difference is so small? Because the sample size is so large. So yes, it's a significant difference, but it's not necessarily a meaningful difference. Okay. Now, that is not to say a one-tenth one of a point change and anything is not important. If we could reduce the number of heart attacks by one tenth of one percent, that's a really large number of people who would not die from heart attacks. So it's also a matter of context. Sometimes we use really, really large samples to try to find significant differences that are actually really, really small. And we go back one more time to the physician health study. How many, do you remember how many doctors participated in the study that to show that aspirin helps prevent heart attacks? It's like 22,000 doctors. Why? Because they were trying to find a really small difference. Because in that sense, a really small difference is still a really meaningful difference. If you can reduce heart attack death by one-tenth of one percent, you've saved thousands of lives. So we've got to watch out for Significant differences being meaningful differences. OK, one more scenario. I love this example. I am doing a study. And that study is investigating how some foods 
make you smarter. Now, I don't know which foods make you smarter, so I'm going to have each one of a sample of, let's say, 100 people try increasing their consumption of particular food. Abby, what's your favorite food? You have a favorite food. You do eat. No. Okay, green beans for you then. Okay, Kyle, favorite food? Brussels sprouts for you then. Danny, you have a favorite food? Carrots. Carrots. More carrots for him. Okay, so you guys are each representative of one sample. You're doing more Brussels sprouts, you're doing more green beans, you're doing more carrots. Jason? Jason. <laughs> That sounds so good. <laughs> okay. Sophia, what's your favorite food? What do you? Spaghetti. So each of you and a bunch of people in your sample are all eating more of these foods. <clears throat> How many different foods am I trying out? I'm going to try 40 different foods. You're only a, the tip of the iceberg in terms of this study. 40 different foods I'm trying out to see if they make you smarter. We're going to do a, a matched pair. So each of you are taking an intelligence test before you start eating more Brussels sprouts or green beans or potato skins or spaghetti. And at the end, you take another intelligence test, and then I look at the difference to see who gained intelligence. I think the person with the carrot gained intelligence. You think so? I think the kid with the potato skins. <clears throat> I think the kid with the potato skins is going to increase their cholesterol. <laughs> but oh, what a way to go. because we know what the alpha value means. We know that the alpha value means that that's our threshold for comparing it to a random result. Um, OK. 
okay? That we might get results by pure chance alone for many of these. Okay, so I think we've gone through some of these ideas. The one I just did with the different foods, it's the one called Beware of Multiple Analysis. That you test so many different things that you're likely to get significant levels, at least some of them. Okay, uh, don't ignore a lack of significance. That's the one that had to do with the uh, um, doctors. That when we try to find really, really small changes that are important changes, that we that we don't we 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 don't ignore something that's knocking on the door of 0.5. Small differences are detectable only with really large size, large, large, uh, large sample sizes. Okay. Lastly, garbage in, garbage out. Poorly designed study, especially one that in which either has bias built into the sampling system or sampling or bias built into the questioning system, those samples, no matter what you do with the data afterwards, the results are bogus. You can't be guaranteed that you get good results out when you have a poor design going in. There's nothing that there's nothing that statistical analysis can do to correct bad design. So when I talk about how seemingly high school females are getting taller, and I have a significant result from my, from my sample, and all of a sudden your ears go up, your sample, you say, what kind of sample? Well, I, I just went to a location and interviewed everyone, all the females that were there. And you say, not random? Yeah. No. Why? Is there something wrong interviewing the, pe the, the females on the basketball team to find out how tall they are? If, I, if my sample is biased, my results are garbage. Okay? Sampling makes a difference. So when you're reading the scenarios of how the data is collected, you need to look for randomness. And of course, the gold standard for randomness is simple random sample. All right. So did we get all of the all of the things that you need to be doubly aware of? What's the other one? Okay. Statistical significance between practical importance. That was the ACT example. My result may be significant, but my, my result may not be important or meaningful. Right. I think we have now gotten through all the information that you need for tomorrow's quiz. All right? So tomorrow will definitely be the quiz. Again, the scenario is because we have to turn this around quickly. I'm going to, as soon as you pass out the, pass the quizzes in, I'm going to pass out the, my answer key so that you can see how you did, so that you can correct those mistakes. If you haven't done so already, the, the, uh, my practice test answers were put into your uh, hanging folder. So you'll need to look at that. Obviously, I'm going to be checking in the 9-3 homework tomorrow prior to the quiz. And then also I'll be answering any questions from the sample test after the quiz. Uh, Michaela, you came in early to ask questions. Do you think you, all the questions got answered in the course of the lecture? Think so? Okay. I'm in early tomorrow morning if you need additional help. I'm going to turn off the recording now. Wait one second, please.